Okay, folks, I think we're going to go ahead and get going. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the second in our uh, fall semester STEM Teaching Essentials workshop series. Um, and um, on behalf of the STEM Steering Essentials, STEM Teaching Essentials Steering Committee, <laughs> Kendra Cherufola, Cherufola, yeah, sorry, mouthful of pizza, <laughs> Kelly Mellenbaugh, um, Corey Feta Hartley, and Suzanne Lang are not here. Um, we'd like to welcome you this year in our series um, for those of you who may or may not be familiar with the series, um, we do meet roughly monthly, uh, but this year we've decided to structure our workshops uh, on a theme of backward design. So our first session last month was uh, about defining learning objectives. And this session and the next session conducted by Corey Feta Hartley et al. Um, will be about uh, assessment also. <clears throat> and so this session is an introduction to assessment. And I'm Mark Urban Lorraine. I'm the Associate Director for Engineering Education Research in the Create for STEM Institute. And um, my research tends to focus on assessment. I've done a lot of work in assessment for many years, primarily in technologically assisted means of assessment. So uh, today, the objectives of our workshop uh, are that uh, we're going to explain how assessment is part of backward design and uh, describe the purposes of assessment we'll be um, <clears throat> introducing some assessment theory and references. Um, uh, at least from my perspective, I think that's important to have some of that background. And uh, we'll have you identify your teaching goals, which you've been working on here. And if you haven't finished that, you can continue to try to multitask while we do this. And um, we'll talk about aligning your assessments with those teaching goals. So at the end of the workshop, you should have at least some idea of how you would align and create an assessment um, that would align with your teaching goals. All right, so we'll start off. This is an interactive workshop. So right now, uh, grab a piece of paper or a computer or whatever you like to write with and write down your thoughts. What are the purposes of assessment? Take about a minute to make, make note of your uh, initial ideas here and uh, what are the purposes of assessment. All right, so uh, just um, we have a microphone that we'll use for qu questions and comments, but I want to just quickly get some feedback. So give me some ideas of what you came up with, purposes of assessment. Yes. Feedback to the student. Casey. Kind of a slant on that, another learning opportunity for students. Another learning opportunity for students, great. Other ideas, yes. Yeah, to show if they're not learning what you want them to learn so that you can make corrections or implement interventions. Okay. Corrective feedback uh, on your instruction. Terrific, yes. Motivate them to learn. Motivate them to learn, that's right. Other purposes of assessment. Yes? Uh, to assign grades or evaluate performance. Assigning grades and evaluating performance. Obviously, we do that. <laughs> OK, yes. Communicate what uh, the instructor values. Communicates what you value, yes. What you assess is what you value. Justify our existence to accreditation agencies. Accreditation agencies, that's very good, OK. <laughs> Other, any other thoughts? All right, so um, again, one of the advantages of uh, doing this is the group is smarter than the individual. And so, um, gee, without my uh, Karnak hat on here, uh, assisting learning is a good thing to do with our assessment here. It's uh, often called formative assessment. Uh, that's the formal terminology, but feedback to students on their progress, feedback to instructors uh, to revise their instruction. These are all important pieces of assessment. and. Um, Really, every bit of assessment is formative, even though summative assessments that give grades. All right, but obviously, that's a, a critical one here. And we do assign grades, and, and at least at this institution and most institutions, that's our responsibility. And we have to have some means and justification for doing that. And then uh, finally, evaluating programs, uh, accreditation, as an example, in engineering, ABET uh, specifically looks at assessment as part of a continuous feedback loop for a programmatic evaluation. All of these different things are purposes of assessment. Different assessments do different things, and you have to somewhat be concerned about what, when you're designing your assessment, what the purposes of your assessment are. You don't want to conflate a summative assessment type with a formative assessment or vice versa. So um, it's important to think about the purposes of your assessment when you are doing your design. All right. 
So as we mentioned, this is part of our backward design um, seminar this semester. And um, <clears throat> I don't know, oh, it looks like we're cut off this. Uh, by the way, I'll, the PowerPoint slides will be on the website afterwards, as will the video that, uh, that it'll take a little while to edit the video, but I'll get the PowerPoint slides up right away. Um, so it looks like we've lost our the bottom of our references here. Um, at any rate, how many of you have heard of backward design and seen some version of this? Okay, Wiggins and McTeague, okay. The idea here is it's called backward design because it's of the fact that oftentimes people talk about what are we gonna teach and then the day before the exam they figure out how to write some questions and uh, they may or may not be aligned with the your, your desired results. And so our goal here is to start with the desired results and the last session talked about that, and you've been doing your teaching goals inventory. We'll connect back to that later on. Um, we're, t we're talking today about determining acceptable evidence. However, this isn't a linear process, and it really does require constant iteration and feedback here. This is an ongoing process, and you want to think of this as not something that's not fixed, but it's a process that's continuous. And you want to use this as your, this is the thing that you're using to um, not only make sure you're aligned with your learning objectives and goals, you may be adjusting them based on the feedback from your assessment and your learning activities. And a slightly more detailed iteration of this uh, comes from Felder et al. Um, again, in a discussion of ABET for engineering, but this applies to all disciplines. And so here again, a little more elaboration, uh, the idea the students are in the center of all this, but you have programmatic outcomes, so whatever your program or accreditation agencies are interested in, along with your goals and your course, and then you start to decompose within the course things like using things like, such as Bloom's taxonomy, et cetera. And there's a variety of assessment techniques including your standard tests, other measures, projects and things, and classroom assessment techniques, and I'll give you some pointers about those a little later on. Uh, yes, okay, so we have, all right, so uh, some assessment theory. Um, I strongly recommend this book. It's uh, one of the many books from the National Research Council. How many of you have uh, heard of the um, How People Learn book? Okay, similar in that series, came out a little bit later than the initial How People Learn, it was a follow-on to that. And again, knowing what students know. So this is a nice synopsis of the literature, and I'm going to give you a brief overview from this. This is available electronically from NRC, it doesn't cost anything to download it, and I would, and, and again, I'll give you information at the end, there's a reference slide. All right, so one of the key points that they make in this book is what they call the assessment triangle here. So assessment is reasoning from evidence, and we have uh, uh, things that we're observing, we have things we're interpreting, and we have cognition. And we're gonna talk a little bit about each of those very briefly. So the first thing is ob observations. What is it that the students are doing? That's the assessment task. That's the thing you're gonna be designing, is, you know, is something for the students to do. Um, that you're going to be using for any kind of assessment, formative, summative, what have you. You do want that to align with your objectives, so you want to make sure that you're asking the students to do something that's relevant to what your objectives and goals are. And um, you're going to be interpreting what they do with some sort of framework for reasoning about these observations. You have some kind of a, um, a framework that you're gonna to do to make some interpretation, and you're gonna make an inference about the cognition based on the observations. And the cognition, of course, is what we really care about. We wanna measure cognition in some way, right? That's the thing, where if we say a student is a four-point student, we're making some claims about their cognition in this discipline, the thinking. However, cognition is a latent variable, and that means we can't observe it directly. If we can't, sticking them in an fMRI machine doesn't do us any good. We can't actually see what they're thinking, so we have to um, make some inferences about that. And the way we make th these inferences are through some theoretic framework or set of beliefs about how the students represent and develop knowledge within our domain. And so whether or not you have an explicit theory or set of beliefs about how students 
represent and develop their knowledge in the domain. You are doing that. Every time you're doing assessment, you're making claims about cognition, and those claims are based on some either explicit or implicit theories of cognition. And so one of the things I would urge you to do if you haven't reflected on this is to think about what your theories and beliefs about student cognition are in your domain and specifically as you design assessments in the context of that class. So again, it's an iterative piece here. What we care about is the cognition, we can't see that. So it's a very messy set of, of uh, observations and interpretation. For those of you in the natural sciences that are used to very exact measurements, this is not an exact science. There's an awful lot of fuzz in here, <laughs> okay? And, and so being conscious of that is really important. All right, so since that's so important, we have to think about cognition, a little bit of history about how we collectively, and in the cognitive sciences specifically, have thought about cognition. Um, and this is, oh, this is American history. It's everything from the 20th century. We don't know of anything that exists before that, right? So, okay. <laughs> So um, early in the 20th century, that was sort of the start of thinking about, uh, about how, do we, uh, how do we measure people uh, because we were doing all this great stuff with the natural sciences, we ought to be able to do it in the social sciences too. And so in the early 20th century, the differential perspective assumed that mental capacities were stable and um, that they were, um, then the point of the assessment was to do something to rank individuals. So individuals are smart or individuals are average or individuals are not so smart. And so IQ tests were created. How many people have ever taken an IQ test? Okay, how many people have taken the GRE? All right, all these standardized tests that are used to rank individuals and to say that this individual performs better than these other individuals at these tasks, and then we make inferences about that. And so that underlying premise carries over into academic settings, and the end result of that was grading on the curve. All right? So the idea that um, mental capacities are stable and that there's some normal distribution of them, and so therefore we have to figure out some way to distinguish the high performers from the average performers and the low performers. Well, a little later in the 1930s, the behaviorist perspective became uh, quite prominent. And um, the idea here was that trying to figure out what, so how does this actually work? The, this idea of the differential perspective of ranking individuals was fine, but it didn't tell us anything about what was going on. How, what are they, how are they thinking? What are they thinking? So the behaviorists were trying to do that, and the behaviorists uh, think that learning was accumulated stimulus response associations, right? Um, you know. Uh, running rats through mazes and ringing bells for dogs when they are given food were stimulus response uh, associations. And so the assumption was that that was what learning was, be it at the animal level or at the human level, and that that's what we were needed to do. And so we would assess these individual bits of knowledge and skills um, because that's what we were interested in was the accumulated stimulus response association. So we give them a question and let them fill in a bubble sheet. And actually, the bubble sheet Scantron machine was invented about that time. All right. Um, in the 1980s, again, without going into a lot of detail, there were a lot of issues with the behaviorist perspective um, that it wasn't able to explain a number of things about human cognition in particular. And so the cognitive perspective started in the 1980s. And the idea here is that learners construct their own knowledge, and they do that by connecting new knowledge to prior information because they're not blank slates. We don't just store stuff in our heads that we have got some prior knowledge, and every time we try to learn something new, we connect that to what we know um, and try to make meaning out of it by making those connections. And there, again, the goal here is that knowledge is more than individual facts, and we're interested in assessing how, when, and if students can use the knowledge, under what conditions can they use that knowledge? Um, can they apply it in new situations? I think that's usually something we would like our students to do, um, and, and do more than just recall individual facts. Um, the cognitive perspective is still pretty, um, 
uh, pretty pervasive. I do a lot, a lot of my work is based on cognitive principles that uh, I do in assessment. But uh, in the 1990s, um, there were some additional concerns about just a strictly cognitive perspective. Learning is obviously something, and cognition is something that goes on inside of our head. But the, co the situative or social cultural folks um, said that that's fine, but learning is mediated by culture and language, and particularly language. How many people have heard of Steven Pinker? Steven Pinker, okay, uh, does a lot of work in cognitive science and language, um, thought as l l language, that's the idea is that all you're thinking is some sort of linguistic activity at, at, the, uh, at the sort of cognitive level. And so um, we have to take into account the fact that we have language and that language is a cultural artifact. And so the idea here is one of cognitive apprenticeship, that learning doesn't take place in isolation. It takes place um, by interacting with other human beings and usually by engaging in some kind of community of practice. And um, here our assessment is uh, to actually assess how authentic the participation in that community of practice would be. And so how many of you can think of an example of this from your own academic disciplines? Examples from your own academic discipline of what that would look like, or uh, does look like. Graduate. Graduate school, fine. How many of you have or are getting PhDs? All right. That, that, is, that is certainly an engagement in a, in, a, in a community of practice, and your dissertation is you know, considered the, the ultimate example of that. But even here, you, know, you have students in laboratory activities. There's a lot of work we're doing here at MSU for encouraging undergraduates to be participating in research um, because it's a good way of learning and engaging them and, and motivating them to have an interest in science. All right, so we have a couple of questions here. This is a raise your hand kind of thing. How many of you started your bachelor's degree after 1990? Okay. How many of you started your bachelor's degree after 1980? This would be, you, you folks that had 1990 or also after 1980, <laughs> okay. How many of you had introductory science courses with multiple choice exams about individual bits of knowledge? A whole bunch of you who started your degree after 1980, okay. How many of you had introductory science courses graded on a curve? A whole bunch of you started after 1980, okay. What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> We hope to fix that. In part, it's because we taught as we were taught, and the history of this goes back well, well before your major professors and mine. Okay. So one of the, th the things that we're most interested in in education is moving uh, our students from being a novice towards some sort of expertise. That's our whole goal here, is to move our students from being novices towards some sort of expertise. And it's, um, it's a developmental process. You're not either a novice or an expert, but there's a series of developmental steps that we take. And so one way of framing this is to think of experts, and um, a lot of research shows that expertise requires over 10,000 hours of practice. And so even upon getting your PhD, you're probably not yet an expert, but we would hope you're proficient. And um, we have novices, and those would probably be our first year students who come in and they have uh, no professional experience, certainly within our discipline. They may have had biology courses or chemistry courses, math courses in high school. But for those of you who are teaching those courses to freshmen, you know that they often come in still not thinking like biologists and chemists and mathematicians. And so our goal here is to help them move along this continuum. And so one of the things you have to think about when you're designing your assessments, when you're designing your instruction is who's your target audience? If you're designing for freshmen or if you're designing graduate work, it's a different task. And so you have to understand where you think your students are as you begin that design process. And part of assessment is to also help determine where they are. So because it's sort of a stepwise and it, you, you make progress and then you fall back, it's not a, a constant upward curve, um, uh, feedback and assessment is really important throughout this process. Okay, so some of the characteristics of novices versus experts is that novices have a lot of isolated facts in their head. And um, 
We often encourage that behavior in some of our introductory courses, but that's just a feature of novices. They're getting this new information, they're isolated because they haven't been able to make meaning out of it in a constructivist perspective. They haven't been able to connect it to their other knowledge. Whereas experts, they have extensive knowledge. I mean, again, 10,000 plus hours of, of experience. Um, the novice isolated facts are decontextualized. Again, they're disconnected. They're just isolated things. They memorize them on flashcards. They don't know what relationship they have to anything else. Whereas the expert knowledge is contextualized. It fits into some larger framework. And so whenever an expert sees a new piece of information within their discipline, that's not just a new fact, but you fit that within your expert schema or framework. And these schemas are the things that you use to organize your knowledge. And uh, for novices, these schemas tend to so focus on the surface features of whatever it is that they're learning, whereas the experts have deep conceptual structures to their schemas. And so some of the earliest examples of this, uh, in, as far as research in learning in the STEM disciplines, comes from physics. And uh, Mickey Chi et al. in the 1980s, back at the sort of beginning of the cognitive science revolution, they studied uh, novice physics students and compared them to expert physicists and so they would ask them to draw concept maps as an example. This is a concept map about various phenomena and so this, con this is a concept map of a novice's idea about inclined planes and what's involved with an inclined plane. Well, there's a plane and there's an angle of incline and it has some surface properties and you know, uh, there might be friction or not, and how long is it, and how high is it, and um, is there a pulley pulling the thing up here? So there's, there's some ideas that the student has brought. These are students who have been studying physics, but they're introductory students. Uh, versus experts, these would be faculty or other expert physicists, um, they draw upon this conceptual structure that they have here. This is, you know, they think about Newton's laws, and when they see some new phenomena that talks about motion, the first thing they do is they think about principles of mechanics. They don't care about what the surface features are, they think about that and they think about it in the context of Newton's laws. And so when given a new phenomena that's about motion, the first thing that a physicist will do is think about these principles of mechanics, whereas the first thing a novice will do is think about what color is the inclined plane. Questions about any of that? Okay. All right, so now it's time to start to digest some of this stuff. So, Kendra, could I get you to pass out? We have another worksheet here. Um, uh, this is now an opportunity to do something with that teaching goals inventory um, that you were filling out while we were eating. And so this is an opportunity to score. This teaching goals inventory comes from the classroom of assessment techniques handbook. And again, uh, this reference is at the end of the PowerPoint slides. And um, I, if you don't have this, I urge you to get it. The intent of this book is to design short classroom assessment techniques that you can use for formative feedback, but its principles apply for all sorts of assessments. And so the teaching goals inventory comes from this. And uh, the goal here is to help you identify what it is that you uh, are interested in for your teaching in your course. So we asked you when you completed the teaching goals inventory to um, think of a particular course that you are or will be teaching. This, so we have different teaching goals for different courses. So whatever that course was, we asked you to complete that worksheet and for each of those items rate them from not at all relevant to um, essential. And so our goal here is right now on the scoring sheet. Everyone have a scoring sheet? Okay, on the scoring sheet, take your initial um, inventory and count up the numbers of essentials in each cluster. Um, that's the top part of your scoring sheet here. So you just go to, for each, uh, in questions one through eight, how many of those did you rank as essential? Two, three, one, zero, whatever it was. You do that for each of the six subset of clusters. And then you can find, and then you can rank them just based on the ones in which you have rated essential. You can also then compute the average by just adding up all the numbers. That requires some math. I see there are some math people in the room, so. Um, but, uh, and so you can do that. Um, and then you can also compare the ranking um, to the averages to see which cluster is uh, most important for your perspective in the course you're thinking about teaching. So we'll give you a few minutes to score that. 
Hopefully, at least you've done the ranking component. If you're still calculating averages, then that's fine. Okay, so based on your rankings, that top part of the scoring sheet, um, we have six different clusters uh, that you were uh, ca calculating ranks for, and your rankings were based on how many items within that cluster um, were rated as essential. So how many had uh, in their top one or two rankings, higher order thinking skills. Okay, so pretty much everybody, okay? How many in their top one or two had basic academic success skills? One, okay, two, that's fine. And again, these are within particular courses. Discipline, specific, knowledge and skills in the top one or two, okay? Much smaller than the first one. Liberal arts and academic values, a couple, okay. Work and career preparation, okay. And good number. And personal development, okay. So some of you have that in there too. Again, so one of the things that's a feature of this is that it's highly variable by discipline and it's also highly variable just by individual course. And so, you know, there's no right answers here. So this is an example of um, from the people from Angelo Cross who developed this, they administered this to almost 3,000 different faculty, and this is just a subset of them. They've done this across all disciplines, arts, humanities, all the, all the disciplines, and so these distributions vary wildly, but since this is a STEM teaching essentials, I focused on the three that were germane to STEM. And so in this context here, 61% of the science uh, faculty in that survey ranked um, the top goal as applying principles, um, and that's the individual goal, so that's, that's the number one within that first one, develop the ability to uh, apply principles. Um, obviously the mathematicians thought math skills were quite important, 84% of those. The science folks, 71% concepts and theories of the discipline. So we've got principles and concepts and theories from the scientists. Uh, Terms and facts are also important for the scientists, but the mathematicians wanted analytic skills and problem solving along with their math skills. And in medicine, again, applying principles is very important, making wise decisions, that's a good thing for medical people to do, and to be responsible for their self. So you can see, again, these are you know, high, highly variable by discipline. So there's no right and wrong answers, but it's like important for you, you know, use this tool every time you're gonna design a course to think about what it is that you want your students to do in this course, and that'll help you focus on the essential stuff, because you can only do so much in 14 weeks. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about, you've identified your goals for your course, <clears throat> and we're gonna talk about aligning those assessments that you think about for your course. And so, how many of you have seen Bloom's Taxonomy before? Okay, and um, there's multiple representations of Bloom's Taxonomy. This is based on the revised Bloom's Taxonomy of Andersall and Crothwell. Um, the main feature that distinguishes that, in addition to flipping the top two uh, items in, in the, um, in the um, taxonomy, is that this one uses verbs instead of nouns. And so we, are, we have action ver words instead of nouns in here. So that's helpful because thinking about verbs is really important when you are talking about your assessment. And so um, the Bloom's taxonomy starts at, the, at remembering, and I like this as opposed to the pyramid idea because these things are sort of concentric or not quite concentric circles, and so they subsume other things. So in order to create stuff, you probably have to be able to evaluate and analyze and apply and understand, and you have to know some stuff. And so these things uh, require sort of the, the level below it in order to do those tasks. But that doesn't mean that you just, as an example, at the freshman level, only get them to remember stuff because they can't remember disconnected facts. So you're gonna to have to help them learn their facts in some context. So one thing that you can do here is, this, this gives you a short description of what you're doing on these, and then here's a set, but not an exclusive list, of verbs, and you have this on the back of your scoring sheet. Um, here's a list of verbs that describe the, the sorts of things that you might want students to do in an assessment that would evaluate their ability to create, or if you wanna, 
uh, evaluate their ability to do evaluation or analyze or apply. There's appropriate verbs here. And you should be able to align those verbs with some of the verbs that are in your teaching goals inventory. And so identifying some of the individual goals from your clusters that you ranked as important would give you some sense. So if you've said that applying the principles and generalizations to new problems and situations certainly is going to at a minimum require analyzing and quite possibly require evaluating in order to actually assess that. So if you say that you want your students to do problem solving and all you do is ask if they can spit back a bunch of facts, that's a misalignment and your assessment is not going to make a valid inference about what they can do. So it's really important to make sure that the assessment aligns here. Again, reminding you that our goal here is to get this assessment to align with the learning objectives and instruction. Okay, so now we're going to talk about how this assessment fits into the instructional design. And so instruction, you can think of instructional design at, at a course level, and then you can think of it within a course at a unit level or module level, and right down to the individual day of instruction that you're doing, and maybe even activities within that. And so this model is a reflection of that scale and you can uh, use it appropriately. So um, one of the first things you're going to need to know is what your students know. You're going to want to do some kind of pre-assessment. You have to have some way of evaluating what the students know coming in. Sometimes that's just did they take the proper class as a prerequisite. That might have been your pre-assessment. It's kind of a course measure, but you're going to want some pre-assessment. But prior to an instructional unit, you're going to want to know what they know. Here, I asked you all what you thought the purposes of assessment were. I wanted to get a sense of what you knew coming in. You're going to do some instructional activity. You'll have designed some instructional activity to try to help them meet this instructional goal that you're, going, you're, you're interested in. So we've had some instruction today. I've given you some introduction to some principles. And then you're going to have some sort of post-assessment. And that's what we're going to ask you to think about right now. We're going to ask you to think about some piece of instruction within that course that you were imagining, not the entire course, but some piece of instruction for which it's reasonable to have an assessment at the end that's aligned with those goals that you ranked as essential. Now the point of that assessment could be summative, but as we said, not only is summative assessment a way of grading students, it's also a formative assessment to provide feedback to the students about their own learning, to provide feedback to you. And after you get done with that assessment, you and the students now have to make some decisions. What is it that you do as a result of that assessment? You may move on to the next planned instructional activity as a result of this assessment. You may have to do some alternative instructional activity based on that assessment. You may have to send them back and repeat until they get it right. Um, because again, depending on what it is, oftentimes in the STEM disciplines, uh, this knowledge is cumulative, and, it, and to, to move on to these other activities, if the students haven't demonstrated mastery and competence of, at, at the level that you're expecting is just suicidal for the students. I mean, and then we lose them out of STEM, and that's a bad thing. So we don't want to have that happen. So, you know, think about this assessment that you're going to design as something that could give you pointers to how might you adjust your instruction depending on what happened and, and how will that assessment reveal different kinds of knowledge or misunderstandings that the students would have. So it's time to actually do some practice here. So your task is to design that assessment that we just talked about. So using your TGI essential goals Identify those goals for that instructional activity, so that box of the instructional activity, which one or some of those instructional uh, goals that you rated essential would you want to address in that. Don't try to do too many in any one instructional activity. Then align um, some Bloom's taxonomy verbs to those goals. Go find the right spot, find the highest level in Bloom's taxonomy. If you need to do some lower level stuff in your assessment, that's fine, but really what we're asking you to do is concentrate on that highest level that's appropriate for that assessment. Then use those verbs to outline. You don't have to write the whole assessment, just an outline. Just draft an outline that's meaningful to you of what that post-instructional assessment will look like and how you would identify the different student behaviors that would be associated with those goals. Remember, the students are behaving, but we have to make those inferences about their cognition. So what behavior can we ask the students to do that we can make a meaningful and justifiable inference about the cognition that says it aligns with that and those student outcomes should suggest some alternative paths for post-assessment. So if the students 
give me this kind of response, that suggests that they understand it. But if they give me a different kind of response, then they are not understanding it the way I would like them to. So I would want to do something else instructionally. You don't have to think about what that something else would be yet. Right now, you just think about what the assessment itself would be. All right. So go ahead and uh, write this down on a piece of paper or on your computer, whatever you do. Um, and uh, we'll take a few minutes to have you outline that, and then we'll have you discussing it with your neighbors. Could I have uh, somebody volunteer to talk about what it is that they came up with here? And Kendra has a microphone, so we can get you on the recording. And I'll, okay. Okay, so mine was a really hard one um, because the goal was to develop commitment to accurate work and personal achievement. Okay. And so some of the Bloom's words were demonstrate and choose. Okay. I thought of. And then the assessment, and again, really hard to come up with. I just said, given the choice between accepting your exam one grade as is, or taking a new exam one, which would replace the grade of the original, which would you choose and why? Okay. So not necessarily give them a new exam, just ask. A ask them for the rationale. And then, okay, all right. So it helped them start to think about that decision-making process. Good, thank you. Other ideas? And again, as I've come around, everybody who's doing has different courses and different things they're struggling with. Oh, come on, I know you were all talking. I'll call on somebody, so come on. Here we go over here. Thank you. I think I can talk very loud. Well, we want to pick it up for the recording. That's, uh, you, there's no, it's not actually in the PA system here. Plus it feels fancy. It so. feels fancy, that's right. <laughs> um, so Katie and I were talking about how our courses kind of fall towards um, away from the novice spectrum. So we kind of, in a way, talked about putting the burden, shall we say, of assessment on the students themselves, right? So self-reflection of um, what did you learn today? Mm -hmm. uh, what went well for you today? Sort of idea of reflecting on the instruction and giving us information that, as instructors for moving forward, but engaging students in self-reflection, not just to tick off, they got all the content, but how are they gonna use it mm -hmm. uh, moving forward? Terrific, that's a, and that's metacognition, and that's one of the key things that experts do really well. Experts think about their thinking. They, they, they track their own problem solving, and when they get stuck, they back up and they think about why are they stuck, and they take another attack, attack whereas a novice just does the same thing over and over and over again, the very definition of insanity. So um, yes, th those great ideas, and there's good, in the uh, classroom assessment techniques, there's good ways of, like there's the, what's the muddiest point, the one minute paper, there's a number of these really nice short assessments that you can look through in that classroom assessment techniques book and find things that align with those goals. All right, so uh, again, as I came around, several people were scratching their heads. This is not an easy task. Um, you know, I didn't ask you to do something that was easy um, because we want to challenge you and we want to engage you to think about this, and I expect you to hopefully think about this after you leave the workshop. So you've start to come up with some rough outline of what it is that you would do for the assessment, but now you're going to have to determine what it was that that assessment tells you. You have to have some framework for interpreting those observations that you've made here, and you have some ideas about the student cognition that you were asking about here, but so, um, you know, and, and again, I, I didn't come around to everybody, but hopefully we're talking about something more than just a fact, multiple, recall, multiple choice kind of a thing here. So we're asking the students to do higher level tasks, and we have to have some way of evaluating that. And we usually do these with what's called a rubric. And here's a nice definition of a rubric. And this, uh, web, oops, this website here has um, a nice set of accessible, comprehensible information about developing rubrics, different kinds of rubrics. And so I, again, these PowerPoints will be on the website. I encourage you to seek that out. But it's a way of assessing student performance along task-specific criteria. And that's the key here. And we have broadly two kinds of rubrics. The first is an analytic rubric. And these are defining levels of performance on multiple criteria. And then the second is what's called a holistic rubric, a global overall rating of performance. And in general, it's easier and more tractable and more meaningful to the students, and it's easier for you to use whole analytic rubrics than holistic rubrics. And again, I, we're going to talk about the analytics more here because we don't have very much time. Um, this will discuss 
conditions under which you might want to use holistic rubrics. But the analytic rubric will give you more detailed and the students more detailed feedback. You have much less whining about how come I didn't get those points. All right. So here's an example of an analytic rubric. This is from a course that I've taught. It's a graduate level seminar on the foundations of engineering education. And so this is a rubric for a project that these graduate students have to do. These are PhD students. So these are, you know, it's a graduate level course. It's a different than a freshman course. But here, what we have as an example is we have criteria. And so the students are doing a project and the project has to have goals. And then we have different achievement levels, an exceptional achievement level, a developing achievement level and an undeveloped achievement level. And so the goals, if they've clearly defined their goals for their project, that's good. If their goals are unclear, that's not so good. They need to work on that. But it gives them specific kinds of feedback that they can use here. And then um, because this is not only formative, but ultimately would become summative, then there are associated points with it. So the criteria, these things on the rows, should align with your goals. And then the rubrics uh, levels define levels of performance. So uh, you can think, again, make a matrix like this to think about how you would start doing um, your criteria for your rubrics. So um, now based on your outline from your uh, assessment that you started to design, we're going to have you start to think about an analytic rubric. And in this process, you will suddenly realize, hmm, this is kind of a vague task. I guess I can't think how I will evaluate it. And that's a good thing because then that will help you sharpen it up. It's better to do that before you give it to the student than after. <laughs> and so um, what you want to do is start to create an analytic rubric, the criteria should align with your assessment goals. And you want multiple individual criteria. So if you've got, they should be doing this and this and this and this and this. Each thing that's separated by an and would be a criteria. Even if they should do this or this, those would still be separate criteria because it's easier for you to pick those individual things out and then figure out, did they do all the things you wanted them to do? So you can use these analytic rubrics to make a more complex environment for doing an evaluation or a grading if you're going to be doing a grading on it. You want to identify, you can, and, and again, three levels, is no, it, there's nothing magic about it. They could be binary, it can be sort of present or absent. They can be five levels. It's just, again, what's appropriate in your discipline at this level for your students. So you want to think about these. But if you start with three, that's a good place to start. And you can usually think of the upper level as exceptional. That's what you really want. At the end of the course, students that really know how to do this should be able to perform at that exceptional level. Usually your undeveloped lower level is missing or absent. They just they're completely missed it here. And then you have some developing middle level that's in between, and that's the one that you often then kind of break up if you say, well, maybe I want five levels, so uh, you know, I'm going to have more stringent requirements for the, for the um, upper level, and then I can kind of subdivide that middle level into two or three other categories. The more categories you have, the more judgment is there and the more discussion you wind up having with students about how those judgments were made. But again, depending on whether you're using this as a formative or a summative assessment, that also dictates as to how much fine granularity you want in that. So go ahead and try, uh, make an attempt at this task here. Uh, make a matrix, take your various goals that you had there uh, for your criteria and then um, how the individuals, if, the, if it was like I'm going to do uh, develop the ability to apply principles and generalizations, you're going to need several criteria to evaluate that. So did they identify the new problem correctly? Did they pick the correct principle to apply here? So those would be things that you would want to do if you were wanting to determine if they could develop the ability to apply those principles and generalizations. And you need to think about that, uh, of what's entailed in an expert performance at this level so that you can see that you identify those things. And then, again, you identify things that are missing, and that's important for that feedback loop that we talked about earlier. So let's go ahead and um, spend a couple of minutes doing this. We're starting to run a little late on time, but we'll, we'll take, give you a few minutes to get a start on this. Okay, if we can kind of uh, wrap up our conversations, I'm, uh, good conversations. And again, this is not easy. Several people have expressed anguish over how challenging this can be. It is quite challenging. I certainly would not uh, pretend that it isn't. And let me see if I just go back here. A couple of questions came up here. 
partly, you know, how do you know if you've got enough point levels if you're, if you're doing exceptional here, either everybody's exceptional or, not, or hardly anybody's exceptional if you're using this for grading. And so you may want to decompose that. And as I was pointing out here, here I, and on this one I had goals of the project and that goals of the project is, has these sort of four sub criteria within it. And so while the overall thing is eight points, they might get these two here, but they might get only these as one point here, and then that, that would give them six points as opposed to eight points. So there's several ways you can do that. Um, you want to probably base this on your prior experience, and if it's the first time you've taught the class and tried this, you want to go slow and do this as a formative assessment. Don't do this for your final exam the very first time if you've never tried this before. So. Um, <laughs> Some hints. Other questions that came up that I didn't happen to catch when I was walking around? Any other questions? Do you at least get the general concept here. That's the point. Is that if you get the, yes? How detailed do you want to make these? In terms of, you know, if it's a if it's an entry level course, you're probably going to want to make it more detailed than or or well, again, and that's, you know, what do you define as exceptional performance for an introductory topic as opposed to a senior or a graduate student? Those are different. So you have to set realistic goals. Exceptional performance does not mean PhD level performance. It means exceptional performance in the context of that class. And so if you break it down, though, like a goal is the project, but the project has five sections to it. So right. break out each section and say what would have been exceptional right. within that. Exactly. And you also want to do it because this, again, the point of this, even if it's summative, is that it's actually formative feedback, always. I mean, you've probably all given your final projects back to students out in the hallway at the end of the semester and they don't pick them up. That's unfortunate. But, um, but that's what happens. But, but the idea here is that you want those criteria to be meaningful to both you and the student. I mean, if the student is self-reflective and a metacognitive learner, then they say, I didn't do very well on this. I'm going to have to go back and study that again. I mean, this instructional activity might be go review this section of the material. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to repeat that particular thing. But, you know, and it could be now go, go read this additional, take this other module, go look at this MOOC or this, uh, you know, uh, con video or whatever. Um, I mean, there's any number of things that you might do there. But you want that, those criteria to be able to give you and the students meaningful feedback on things they can do to improve their performance. That's the thing, is you want to, if the goal is to try to help every student get to his or her potential and potentially, in theory, if they were admitted to MSU, if they all work hard, they should be able to all get four points. We, don't, we shouldn't be grading them on the curve. If they do the work and you define the criteria appropriately and you help them, they should be able to all theoretically get to a four point. It doesn't happen in reality, but if you're using criterion-based grading, that could happen. Yes? So, uh, hold on, hold on. Yes. Oh, Mike, I'm sorry. Uh, one of the main reasons that I usually feel we want to use the curve is to try to normalize, you know, oh, you know, I wrote this test a little too hard right. or, you know, um, and, you know, I, th I think the same thing is a, still a challenge with the rubric, you know, you may just, uh, your, your idea of what exceptional performance is may be unreasonable. Right. Right. Um, so do you have anything about how we should adapt to that? Certainly, and that's part of that feedback process. I mean, you know, it's sort of the first time it, you teach any course, it's always a challenge. You try to, you might, again, you want to go look at some literature, find out what other people know about teaching this topic for students, um, talk to your colleagues, get some sense of what's going on there. The, this idea of setting standards and then if you realize that you set the bar too high, raising all the boats, but that's a slightly different thing than curving it to force some people to fail. And, you know, that's a slightly different arrangement there. So if it's like, gee, sorry, I over, expected, I, I overestimated what it was that was appropriate, uh, you know, this was way too hard, you know, uh, mid-course correction is perfectly reasonable, but if you're doing frequent enough assessment, it won't get too far out of whack. If all you do is a midterm and a final, that's pretty dangerous, right? But if you've got ongoing feedback and you're doing homework and you're doing stuff in class and you're getting feedback from your students, you should be able to track roughly where the bulk of the students are going and be able to keep your instruction adjusted. And so while you may lay out an initial syllabus somewhere down the line that first, that first pass through the course, you may have to make some corrections. So giving yourself a little slack when you first design a course, try not to put too much stuff in 
And that way it gives you a little bit of wiggle room if you can avoid that. These are all possible ways of using it. But again, this is all feedback for your instructional design as much as it is for the grading the students. Becky, I think, uh, get the microphone here. So I had a question. I wanted to go back to when you were talking about using blooms to kind of um, align learning objectives with assessment tasks. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was just wondering if you or others in the room have ideas about other ways or frameworks that people have identified this assessment item reflects this learning objective. Like it seems really way too easy and dangerous to kind of say like, oh yeah, asking a student to like convert the number of nanometers to meters is like analytical thinking. You know what I mean? Like it's right. too easy to sort of like. Yeah, to delude yourself into thinking this high level yeah, thinking. Yeah, so yes. how have you or how have others in the room done that kind of thing? Uh, comments from others in the room. Anybody have initial thoughts? Yes, Rob? In a summative assessment, a, a, a mechanical conversion like that between meters and nanometers, yeah, it's something we want to do, but it's worth one point. And if they, you know, goof that and get the rest of the problem right, it's still only a one point deduction. So by, you know, or, you know, in some of my assignments, you know, okay, calculate this number, now evaluate this number, what does it mean? That's worth something right. also. So right. it's but like that's basically embedded the, a larger students, task. Right. the students will do what you want them to do in terms of points. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, again, yeah. assessment, uh, wh how, how the assessment shows the students what you value. But if you're embedding those c calculations in a larger task, then that's an important piece. Um, I think that there's a lot of power in cross-disciplinary sort of collaboration when it comes to, I f it, feel, it feels like you're asking, like, how do we assess the validity of our sort of assessment of our own learning right. goals? Like, yeah, yeah. Is, it, is this actually evaluating, or did I just call something that is remembering, evaluating? Yeah. And I think that when you talk to somebody who isn't as familiar with your class and your students and the way that things have been assessed for a long time, they have to reinterpret it sort of from scratch, and then they, you might not fall into that same pit yep. that you are, where you're like, okay, well, this is high level because it's really hard for students. Whereas if somebody hasn't seen your students before, they're like, well, it seems like they're just doing division and reassigning <laughs> units, and, and, and maybe that's a strength of these sorts of groups. Terrific. Um, and this is a great, uh, I didn't know maybe Becky was a shill in the audience. It's a great plug for our next session. Corey Feta Hartley is here. You want to t uh, take a second to tell people what, uh, what you'll be doing next time that maybe sure. helps address yeah, that that's question. What, Becky, I was about to say the 3D lab, but <laughs> 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 yes, of course you do. Um, so uh, what we'll talk about next time is another way to think about these same kinds of things that Mark's been talking about and that Jim Lucas talked about last time. And we developed an instrument, and Becky's a lead author on a paper that's going to be published about it soon, um, is uh, a tool called the 3D Lab to help you develop these assessments. And instead of using Bloom's taxonomy, what it does is focus on science practices. So specifically, the language that we use as scientists and engineers, their scientific and engineering practices, using that instead of going directly to Bloom. So uh, there'll be another opportunity to apply these things and get some more practice. We'll try not to make it too redundant. There will be overlap, certainly, but um, hopefully it won't be redundant. So that's four weeks from today in the same room at the same time. Um, but Kendra reminded me of another workshop that I should mention that's being sponsored by the College of Natural Science. If you're on the STEM Alliance listserv, you would have gotten it but it's called Creating an Inclusive STEM Classroom Strategies and Skills Development. This is a follow-up to a workshop that we held last February as part of the STEM Teaching Essentials, led by uh, Kendra Kinabashi and uh, Danielle Lopez and others. I went to that one, it was fantastic. Um, they had a student panel, it was, it was really illuminating. Part of what you're supposed to do for that next workshop is watch that video. So um, hopefully you'll um, consider that. Um, it's October 24th, uh, 11.30 to one, and it's in the Student Services Building. So if you're not on the STEM Alliance listserv and you're interested in that, just shoot me an email and I can send you um, the information and the link to the, um, the registration for that. Okay, and with that, um, let's thank Mark for a uh, very engaging work. Oh, references. And if you would fill out the evaluation form on the way out uh, and grab if there's any food left, feel free to help yourselves. Thank you all.